and uh, it's my pleasure uh, to um, welcome you in our cafe, which is literally a cafe. For the ones that have joined before, um, they know that there is an innkeeper, which is me for tonight. And you are um, welcomed as well uh, by Baba Canenzo, um, that are behind, well, work, listen, create, and sound talk September. And uh, we join with you bi-weekly to have a talk um, introduced or provoked uh, by a guest in our cafe, hoping to have an, an animated uh, talk, which is not uh, just about listening to Stan, or not just about listening neither, but as well um, sharing your practices, your ideas, um, and um, what you have in mind about uh, the topic we will explore uh, tonight. So, I'm uh, very uh, happy to introduce uh, Stan, uh, which is a dear colleague and a friend, who um, uh, is from Ghent in Belgium. He uh, has uh, studied philosophy and mixed media, has a background in um, as a performer and in uh, theatre and circus. He uh, worked together with uh, people like uh, Jan Fabre in Belgium, and he started uh, quite some time ago uh, the iPhone organization uh, that is researching and exploring the relationship between listening and our world, uh, with a very important focus on the collective experience, uh, participation and collaboration, and how we uh, in the society connect with each other. Okay, hello everybody, I start again. Uh, nice seeing you. Hello. Uh, thank you, Geert, Babak and uh, Andrew for inviting us uh, in the, during, this, uh, during this talk. Um, and I will show you some pictures also. I will share my screen, my PowerPoint, and talk a little bit about uh, the work we do with iPhone. And in the end, I, um, I want to tell you more about Sound Atlas. This is a project we do with uh, visually impaired people. And there I'm a little bit insecure. I become a little bit insecure because I'm moving in a, in a field that I'm not at home, uh, saying I'm moving myself in a field of language, linguistics, and this is not my profession or where, where, where I'm specialized in. So uh, I want to tell you a little bit uh, of this research, research I'm doing, but I'm doing this in a very intuitive way as a sound artist. Uh, but uh, I want to use this cafe. I want to use all of you to think along with me. And I hope in this cafe, I can share some ideas but also I'm very um, curious about yours. I'm very curious also about your ideas about this project, but maybe for a little bit more context, I will show you uh, my PowerPoint and share my screen. This is how iPhone is written. iPhone uh, has a crown, we exist 15 years and iPhone is actually um, a name we constructed uh, one year before before Steve Jobs' telephone, and I stands for uh, love and harmony in uh, Japanese, and phone is Old Greek for sound. Um, I'm uh, artistic director of uh, iPhone, and um, yeah, as Geert told, uh, we are a Belgian organization with a collaborative practice. We do projects workshops, productions, and we focus on the listening. And probably uh, most of you already know that listening is a very personal thing. It's a very personal negotiation of kind of mental relationships between sounds, silence, and acoustics. And these relationships are formed by and colored by actually our history, our memories, our culture, education, context of the listener. Um, these are, yeah, this is how we perceive and how we see uh, or how we approach listening, uh, especially because we are living in a very visual society. 
And the mobility, the mobility of the listening of the people is often very rusty and often, allez, sometimes you also see like um, uh, allergic char characteristics because uh, sound and listening is, and especially sound is associated in the public opinion with uh, ear damage and uh, um, uh, noise pollution, all these things, all these things. An iPhone actually wants to move the public opinion through listening exercises, co-creation uh, and exchange projects uh, by making uh, also listening performances and uh, uh, productions. Um, second slide. Our artistic core and methods and mission. You see some teams. We uh, handle some teams like semantics on sound, silence and listening. I come back on this issue later. Uh, in my introduction, I also say uh, listening is a very personal thing. So it's very important that we see the diversity in the listening and the flexibility also of the listening of the people and working on that and uh, collaboration, uh, collaborative uh, projects. Also listening attitudes and strategies are um, things we uh, investigate on an artistic way. And a topic as intercultural listening is very important to um, highlight and to work around. I also will uh, connect this topic to another project we do. Uh, methodologically, um, we work in a very physical and spatial way. We want uh, uh, listening is not only a thing of uh, our ears, but the whole, bo whole body. And the work we do is very transversal uh, in, in, in the way that we work very spatial and we don't make only a soundscape in stereo, but we want to work in a, in a surround kind of way, uh, recording sounds, uh, playing sounds back through speakers, placing speakers all around the public space, uh, maybe putting speakers on the body and moving with the body or, uh, putting a speaker on a rope and, and to swing the speaker, this kind of, all this kind of very practical, hands-on way to approach sound and to research how does it influence the listening, yeah? So in short, we, we are not that interested in sound as such, but we focus more on what happens before, during and after the sound. So we approach actually uh, sound as an experience and listening is a kind of a movement. Um, so if we talk about compositions, it's more likely that we talk about the choreo choreography, sorry for my English, choreography of sound and the scenography of listening. Um, and we do that because uh, we want to build on a richer listening culture and we don't do this alone, we do this together with other organizations. I have for you some interesting links. So the first link, maybe I can post these in the, in the chat. Uh, the first link is a, a, um, a text we wrote about uh, the art of listening or listening art. Uh, we also translate it in English. We also have a text we made with uh, eight other um, artists. These are a hybrid collection of artists. So there's also a photo photographer, uh, a composer, uh, a visual artist. So it's not only sound artists who were in this group. And we did listening sessions. And during these listening sessions, we discussed what we heard and how we experienced the sounds. And at a certain moment, we decided to make a list of all kinds of listening attitudes. So it was a little bit utopic to make a list, uh, not uh, wanting to be complete, but to, uh, to try to make a list. And also this list is very participatory. So it ends with three dots. So people can add in a way their own listening attitudes or own um, experience with uh, the listening. Um, we also make, made a reader for the students uh, in international projects. Some of the links, most of the links are in English and they are mostly cons uh, concerning uh, deep listening and uh, 
acoustic ecology and there is one project I want to highlight also and this is starttolisten.org so this is the website of start to listen this is a free website we made for uh, teachers and their children in elementary schools uh, teachers and children uh, in elementary schools can use this for free uh, just by signing in and this is a, a website uh, that has listening fragments and listening questions so the teacher uh, will uh, I will click on this so you can see it it's a free free uh, website you can log in and you, then you see three series of listening fragments and each series has 15 fragments so that we say that if a teacher does this every day he will do this for three weeks every day he listens to one fragment and then he can uh, click on the listening questions and in the listening questions if one is interested i have english translations of these questions i also have english translations of how you what's the what's the the goal of the website and how you work with the website so i can send it to you but in these listening questions, we want to um, engage and challenge people to listen in a more adventurous way, to listen uh, on, not only to how a person listens oneself, but also to listen to how other people are listening, which kind of framework they, they are listening in. And so by repeating this each day, we hope that people uh, so the teacher together with the pupils will grow in the listening and uh, yeah we not only do listening fragments uh, sorry listening questions so people can talk about it or reflect about it verbally we also engage people to reflect on it and uh, with sculptures with drawings with performances uh, and all these kind of things so it's a very open way to uh, to step in this project um, yeah, in the meanwhile, we have like five or six hundred um, teachers using this. Uh, so we uh, we made it bigger. So we don't have a series one. We have also series two, which has a little bit larger fragments and time. And series three, we actually um, challenge people to not only listen in the classroom, but also uh, what does what will happen if you listen certain sound fragments, uh, for example, in um, in a public space or in the mall, or what happens if you turn the volume very low and how does it interact with the environment? This kind of um, challenges, and we have we are also grow making uh, more playlists. So we have like. Um, also a Flemish playlist, a Wallonian playlist, a Turkish playlist uh, with other organizations. We work together. We also ask to make a playlist to, uh, to make it bigger and also to, 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 make, the other, uh, to uh, make the other organizations uh, be involved in this project. A few other projects I want to be brief. I, will, I hope to be brief. It's not easy for me because all these projects have lots of uh, angles and nuances and and funny anecdotes but uh, i will do it briefly uh, phonorama is one of the projects we do lately we did one in ghent now we are doing a phonorama in bruges and um, another one in ghent but phonorama is actually uh, a project that um, we want to reflect in neighborhoods and cities about how we live together auditively and uh, we do that we we have the starting point and the starting point is record sounds record please record fascinating sounds of your neighborhood and with the collection of uh, recorded sounds we uh, give it back to the the neighborhood and they choose 20 sounds and these 20 sounds go in a time capsule that goes under the ground for 20 years. So this is the beginning and the end, but in between we do different other projects. Um, here you see the device we developed to, uh, 
to make recordings. So people makes a recording and then he gives it to his neighbor or somebody he knows in the neighborhood. And in this way, we, uh, we get deeper into the um, uh, sonical arena of the, of the city. People are also allowed to record uh, inside, inside their houses, not only outside, because the neighborhood is more than only um, the borders of the houses. Here you see the time capsule going under the ground. This was the case in, in Ghent. So in 2040, we will dig up the time capsule again and we will listen together to the sounds we recorded uh, uh, yeah, last year. Last year we ended this project of three years. And uh, yes. And this is the tile where it's uh, buried under the ground in Ghent. Another project we do uh, is uh, the city rings um, and Geert was also involved in this project um, and other organizations were involved. Here I have a map on a certain moment we had like eight organizations all, ar all around Europe um, where we did simultaneously workshops. For example, uh, we did a, a, a workshop in Brussels and Geert was doing a workshop in, uh, in Porto, for example, and uh, we did it, uh, we, we, uh, we said we do it in these two weeks, and in these two weeks we, we meet six times. And in these six times we change sounds and we change pictures and all these kind of things, and the goal was to make uh, auditive city portraits. So how uh, do children listen to their city? And how do they present their city by recording sounds and composing sounds via a W uh, via um, via a DA, uh, DAW uh, montage software uh, in the school? And this exchange uh, is is very important because we gave people the tools to communicate about their city uh, without um, spoken words, without words actually, but only by the means of sound and sound composing sound. So when I talk about sound in the whole um, presentation, I, I don't mean music and I don't mean uh, spoken language. So this was also the case in the city rings. The city rings Europe is a little bit sleepy now, but we are uh, revitalizing the project uh, by doing it more intercontinental uh, and uh, we will start a project in, uh, in October with Montreal. Uh, and yesterday I had uh, a talk with people, nice people of Istanbul, and Geert connected me with some people in South Africa. So it's moving in uh, other directions, but we want to do it more uh, in a serial way, not parallel, because it was a lot of work to, to deal with all the holidays, all the vacations of all the organizations and it was becoming a little bit too log logistical, yes. Yes, we do also sound and listening walks. Here you see uh, in the left side, you see a helmet we developed for a, a city uh, exhibition in SMAC. This is the Museum of Contemporary Art. And this helmet has a directional microphone on top and you have the, the headphones where you heard the, the, the environment uh, amplified and the people were masked so they couldn't see anything but they were taken by the arm and in this picture we were doing some um, uh, games uh, but you have to imagine we do uh, sound walks in the city and there was one blindfolded and the other one was guiding and um, the sound artist was uh, guiding the whole group and in the middle the, the people changed and we did it like that. And the other one is uh, our listening walks. These are walks we do with, uh, with speakers in the backpack. So there is a, a sound composition in, uh, in, the backpack, in the backpack and it's produced um, uh, sound composition but also lots of silence in the composition through uh, the speakers. And people uh, walk a, a certain um, traje trajectory, yes. So we add a fictional layer on the 
on the reality, on the auditive reality of the city. Oh yes, this project is also a huge project. I will do it very short. Uh, this is a presentation. Uh, no, this is a listening performance we made with a, a circus artist. And we, uh, we put all speakers in his costume. Uh, we also, he's a, a strap artist. So we also could put speakers in the straps. So he could uh, swing the speakers around uh, the space and the public was sitting around the, the, the performer. So you see uh, a little bit the, the performer and his speakers. And here you see the, the people sitting around the performer who was all also like swinging his own body with all the sounds coming through the speakers. And if that is not enough, uh, also the people are carrying a backpack. I'm now referring to the previous project uh, where we carry also the backpack uh, during the sound walks and the people who carrying the backpack are also carrying speakers and these for this uh, performance we developed a speaker system and it's called the swarm translated it's the swarm and the swarm is able to um, these are 20 speakers they are wireless and we can uh, send 20 different sounds to 20 different speakers uh, wireless via Wi-Fi and this system we are also developing not only to work inside like in a black box of theater but we are developing the swarm also to do sound walks to do sonorizations and public spaces and collaborative projects to reflect on how do we want to live auditively together and this is in a full uh, development right now yes sound atlas Sorry for my long introduction, but I wanted to taste you a little bit of all the kind of projects we do. And now I'm feeling insecure. That's now the moment. Um, Geluiden Atlas or Sound Atlas was a project we did in 2020. This project was with blind people in the context of Phonorama. This was the project with the time capsule. And um, we were recording sounds with the blind people also to put in the time capsule. And there, there was a teacher, the only teacher actually in Belgium who um, teaches the blind people to do echo localization. So the, the technique of clicking with the tongue and with clicking of the tongue, they make um, an acoustic image of the, of the place. So this is very helpful for blind people to navigate in public space, but also indoors, not to bump into tables and things like that. But uh, for this, in this learning process, um, they do it by conditioning. And uh, in this conditioning, they say, yeah, uh, if we click against uh, glass or we click against water, we hear the differences, but we have no language to speak about it. We cannot say what is the difference. Uh, so we have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So it would be nice to have language because if we have language, and now I, be, I come closer to this quote of Wittgenstein, if I have language, I can talk about how it sounds and I can make my, uh, become my world more the world of me and also this became a little bit the quote of the project if we have if we uh, grow in language then the 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 meaning uh, the possibilities the the, the 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 poverty in sound i mentioned in the introduction can be a little bit solved also not only by doing projects also by um, investing in, in, in building on a, on a sound language. So uh, this, um, to anticipate on this uh, poverty, we developed this poster you see next to the picture. And there we, um, yeah, we uh, ranked all kinds of words who could refer a little bit to to uh, sound and we categorized an emotion and then texture and then animal sounds and then uh, rhythm and all these kind of uh, things. 
but um, this was not like enough for us. This was nice to do as an exercise, but we want to go a little bit further. Actually, we want to make a, like a very dynamic tool so people can navigate in the in the world of sounds and make it easier not only for blind people but also for sighted people to uh, reflect on um, language and sounds. So the plan is that we are going to do in October, we are going to do a workshop with the blind people and to uh, make a tool. Probably this will be a website or something mobile people can take with them where uh, language will be combined with sounds. We are not there yet, but we are doing this like in every uh, process, we're doing this step by step. But to spice it a little bit up and to, if, uh, to rest my voice a little bit, I, will, I will, would want to, uh, to let you hear a sound file. And um, I will ask you to describe the sound. I will push on this button, but before I push on the button and you will hear the sound, I would um, um, invite you to listen to the sound and to um, to listen to the sound and, and I will ask to to describe the sound afterwards and very important there is no right or wrong uh, if you answer um, on my question uh, you don't have to be shy there is no it's not a quiz okay? you will not be punished neither so I just sat up and let you hear the sound. Now I'm very curious about what you have to say, people in the cafe. <laughs> Is there somebody who wants to start? I'll happily start. Okay. Um, so um, the first thing that I notice is that it's very difficult for me to uh, describe the sound in words that are um, uh, qualitative, um, but it's much easier to describe the sound that I heard in terms that this that describe what I think is being touched, uh, so or being played. So uh, words that I would use to describe this would be something like uh, um, uh, swiping uh, a uh, maybe metal object uh, against a series of glass bottles or uh, pulling uh, um, a little stick uh, uh, along um, uh, broken tiles. Uh, that, so that, so it, it, this, what I would like to do is describe what might have made this sound. But I have no idea how to describe whether the sound triggers a particular feeling or emotion or um, has, a, 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 well, something that's qualitative. For, so, but I did write down, rasping as a descriptive uh, term is it sort of like heckling the sound is clattering okay. i've got something to say can you hear me yes okay. creating a new vocabulary away from the stereotypes and expectations surrounding sound which is through educating us how to listen without preconceived ideas, i.e. 
Not putting labels on things, letting the sound speak. Yes, thank you, Robert. I agree. But uh, for the for the for the blind people who are asking this, and for the visual people who are not listening, it's maybe interesting to to challenge people. And I don't actually, I'm not looking for the truth. I'm only looking for people who want to reflect on listening and on sounds because well, now the people we meet are often a little bit kind of deaf. <laughs> and in yeah, this way, you... sorry. sorry. Okay, coming back. Well, for example, taking blind people, uh, in comparison with us, you, what you would be doing would be learning from them rather than them learning from you because they've got a, a much broader sonic world in which they live. So really what you're doing is trying to touch their world through, you know, the less the sophisticated methods of people who can hear because they have many other things. And so you're hoping to make a meaningful bridge, but from them talking to you rather than you um, talking didactically to them. So it, 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 it's opening up a door rather than informing. It's a different process. Yeah. It's a humble approach. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Thank you. Uh, Are there other people who want to describe the sound? I'll, I'll give it a go. I, I thought it was like... Um... Uh, a bit like Babak, I, I couldn't find uh, necessary words to decide, describe it, but I could think of something that would make that noise. And um, we, we, we have a, a, a little slot box, like a, um, a, a money box, which is um, where you drop your loose change into, <laughs> the, uh, into this box, yeah? Uh, and the one we have is, uh, made of um, uh, uh, China and is um, uh, looks like a, a VW camper van with a surfboard on it, and the slot is in the surfboard. But to get the money out, uh, there is a hole in the, you know, uh, un under the chassis. So you turn the thing upside down. And the hole is only just big enough to sort of get a small finger in. Not not your sort of index finger, but your, one of the other fingers you're less familiar using. And therefore you have to sort of click around trying to get the coins either back through the slot through which you drop them or out through the hole in the bottom of the, mm -hmm. of the slot box. And then when you can't, you get a frustration and you shake at the thing. And then, you know, and then you try again. And then you get your fingers stuck in there, and then, oh God, you know. So, uh, I have no words to describe it apart from perhaps, you know, tinkering or clinking or something like that. But I have the frustration of not being able to get the coins out of the slot the box. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, but. Um... We, we, we let these sounds uh, already hear to different other people. Um, and if I did a, a vox pop, like I went in the street, I let the people hear this sound and try to describe the sound. A lot of the people are making associations uh, like you do a little bit um, and they re refer to uh, yeah, this kind of situations they have in their own life or history or whatever. Uh, but when I said in this interview to the people, yeah, you associate, for example, with popcorn, but I never ate popcorn, I never saw popcorn, how would you then describe the sound? And then I hear a, a, a deep gap of silence <laughs> suddenly, because we don't have a lot of words and to talk about it, to describe it, to, 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 yeah, if we taste something and we, we want to share what we taste and it's a little bit sweet or salt or whatever we can, we can connect in a way about the same thing we are tasting. Uh, we are at this moment also making a podcast with a, a sound designer, a museum director, 
a sommelier, somebody who tastes wine, and uh, a professor linguistics. And what was very curious, when I let the people hear the sound, everybody was reflecting on the sound by their profession. So the sound designer was, oh, there is like uh, uh, the, the mid-high frequencies were like this. And the, the museum director, he has like, a, oh, it's a tableau vivant. And the sommelier had, a, had a, not a wine, but a, she had a meal with sugar and, and this kind of porcelain and, 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 and all these things, and, and et, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, the professor linguistics was looking for a word and, and analyzing the, the words. And he was also saying like, there is in Japanese a word and it's buku buku. What do you think? Is it well-rounded, a, a person well-rounded or a person skinny? And uh, I said, yeah, it's, I think it's well-rounded. Correct. Uh, Japanese is also koro koro. What do you think? Is it rolling or floating? I say, yeah, rolling, of course, correct. So he was pointing out there are also certain vowels, certain sounds in the language you use that's not very far from the, the meaning and the connection with, uh, with the sound. So I want to hear from you guys. I'm also very curious about other examples, other uh, people who have uh, experience with describing sounds or uh, how sounds are described in other cultures. So if people want to um, reflect on that, it would be very helpful for me to give also this project a certain kind of direction. Nobody else is coming in, so is it, I don't want yes. to... I'm coming. Do you mind? Okay. You, um, you, you say it's about exchanging um, uh, our different points of view. Well, mine's radically different to yours, and I'm wondering if I, if I tell you roughly what it is, you might be able to tell me how your your process would inform mine, because that's basically what I want to expand beyond it. Essentially, I think as far as seeing the science goes, that we don't see what's out there. Uh, the brain has a sort of holo uh, uh, an hallucination, that, that a standard form that it puts in front of our eyes, and the process of perceiving is modifying that to fit in with the brain's hallucination. It's essentially, we're seeing hallucinations that are modified through the act of perception. That's roughly it. It's more complex than that. And similarly with sound, what I'm getting is the feeling that you're seeing sound as something out there that needs to be reported. In as much as when you see something, it's been changed by science, confounded. There's not something, because what we're seeing is an hallucination our brain creates. So we're not seeing something out there anyhow. I'm wondering, because, you know, they, they say that a third of all the, 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 the things that join the optical sense to the brain, it, it's a third of it. I'm just wondering if sound is just as big, but it just hasn't been explored by science because they haven't, they don't know how to think around it. It's, this is a very emergent subject and i'm just wondering if the for example there's that that analogy with optics is a good one to, to the process of, of hearing i.e there's not something out there you can't stick a microphone on it and record it just like you can't take you could take a photograph or make a movie of something <laughs> but as artists for my point my practice that's superficial design got beyond that in painting and i'm just wondering is there ways in which your investigations are probing beyond these <coughs> excuse me, preconceived ideas. Is there a way that it, we could join hands, so to speak, and make links? Yeah, uh, thank you for your uh, um, remark, uh, Robert. Um, there is a paradox, of course, there is a paradox in this, uh, in this project, uh, because if you listen to my uh, introduction, uh, listening is more complex than um, connecting word, words with sounds because listening is also resonating with the sound. It's uh, also vibrating together with the sound. And if you put uh, a sound uh, in a hermetic situation or you put the same sound in a cathedral, it changes. Uh, it's it's um, yeah, there, there, there. You have the acoustics 
coloring the sound. Uh, I often do also like uh, listening exercises and I have a, a sound file of rain and I will, when I let the, the people uh, hear the rain in the morning, 50% of the people associate the rain with uh, the shower. And when I let the, the people hear the sound fragment uh, around noon, they associate the rain with melting butter, so with hungry. So also the context of where we are in the moment and uh, if you are in love or not or whatsoever is also um, changing the perspective, that's for sure. Um, this is the paradox I have with my own project, but nevertheless, <laughs> I think I'm always like eager to do this impossible by not avoiding uh, the sounds uh, and the impossible to try to describe sounds. I want to try to describe it and I want to make it, uh, I don't want to make it complex, I want to make it easy but I want to point out that it's very complex. So in the end, when we have a tool, it's not uh, my uh, goal to be encyclopedian, but my goal is to let people reflect on this, to open questions, to say it's impossible or to say it's not blue, but green. And um, it would be nice that um, if it becomes like a website, when we have like a, a mapping of words and, and sounds that um, when people visit the website and uh, they do a hearing test, for example, they hear first this kind of sounds that the, the, the sounds during time can move from words as people are, um, how would you say it, consulting the website. You understand what I mean? So for example, yeah. One, one sound can be rolling, but as people uh, visit the website, it can travel from rolling to floating, maybe. I don't know. Uh, actually, to be honest, I don't care if it's rolling or floating as such, but I want to open this discussion. I want to uh, highlight and with uh, Fluo, uh, the, 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 the complexity of sound and, and, and maybe the impossibility impossibility of, of describing it. But if the, the, the sommelier has words, and if the barista has words, and if the, the, the visual artist has words, I, want, I also want to have words. And they are right and wrong at the same time. Something like that. Thank you. It sounds to me like uh, what you're identifying or what you're uh, noticing or discovering is the challenge of constructing s simply a new language. I mean, this uh, ties very much into uh, the Wittgenstein quote uh, that you uh, uh, brought forward. Um, I mean, when humanity uh, was emerging and language was forming, no one had words for anything, right? So the words that we developed or that we started using uh, now 200,000 years ago, uh, were extremely um, descriptive, not abstract. Um, and we have evolved to, to uh, create an abstract language around visual um, uh, identifiers, because this is something that, uh, well, this is the one thing that we have developed very much. Um, but we don't have indeed words to describe uh, auditory experience. So this then means that we only, or at least as I was doing earlier, when you asked and I responded, the only thing I can do is I can be descriptive in the sense that, well, it sounds like uh, glass bottles are being hit. Uh, and I can't say uh, it's, uh, um, it's melancholic or something. I don't know, maybe it is melancholic for some, but not for me because I don't abs uh, associate this abs these abstract um, uh, words with uh, something that I'm used to only describing in concrete terms. Um, but also, Christian Pollock, I think, raised his hand earlier. He took it down his hand, but maybe he still has a question. If not, that's also fine. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yes. Hi. Um, hi there, and thanks for the presentation, Stein. Uh, it's a very fascinating project, I think. Um, one question for clarity. I'm wondering, um, so what the purpose 
again is of of the sound atlas i mean the i guess different motivations behind it but if I, i'm wondering if um let's say if it's also supposed to be let's say a communicative tool yeah how to make oneself uh understood by the other by you know talking about sounds and the listening experience i'm wondering to what extent also let's say the feeling states you know how actually the sound is of course it's touching and um stimulating my my mind so in terms of associations in terms of memories um and so i'm locating immediately like the sound source and the dynamic in terms of mental images and so on out there you know um but there's this body component so where the sound if i try to associate it or identify it or not it's hitting my ears somehow somewhere and it's you know it's um triggering something in my body i'm i'm feeling it's make it makes me feel in a certain way and so i'm wondering to what extent also um you know departing from from the feeling component how it makes you sense basically um if this is also part of of the project <clears throat> uh thank you for your question christian this will be uh, certainly the part in the project while we are doing the workshops um we will do the workshops with uh, blind people in october um for a pretty long time pretty intense time um there we want to um in the first place our goal is to answer on their question a little bit what kind of words can we use to in this echolocation conditioning learning process to to uh, to make it easier to make it clarifying uh, so that i click on the water or click against the glass it becomes easier when i connect it to a word so this is the first goal and the second goal is that uh, as uh, robert also pointed out a little bit uh, that we want to use the the power of the impair of the of the blind people to also um trigger the sighted people who are mostly deaf in a way um to uh, to think about it to reflect on it because when i did the previous workshops they say the words we have in in our language are often referring to visual um qualities that we don't have so if we talk about sound then we have to use visual words that's that's not part of of our world so this is a little bit um the goal of the project i don't know i know your question was more than only asking for the goal uh i i would say that yes the the the, the tool we are making will not be resonate resonating in the body and 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 um going in this deeper level of listening but it will hopefully open uh the discussion i hope this is a an answer yeah yeah thank you very much yeah. just a little afterthought on that you know um there is a uh, what's her name her her last name is tolas um it's a i don't know where exactly from Scandin scandinavian artist based in berlin i can send you the link but she i mean she's an olfactory artist and and scientist and so is she's in the worlds of sense uh, and uh, smell and she developed a sort of dictionary for finding words for describing smell right and sense because there is also a very very difficult we have the, the same difficulty basically right we don't have any vocabulary to accurately describe our olfactory experiences yeah so i don't know to what extent you 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 heard about her but yeah it made me think a bit of of that actually no i didn't i i i don't know the name i would be very um thankful if you if you would send me uh, the name uh, i can i can show you one more slide of a a barista my favorite barista and she made like this um forms so on the labels of the coffee you have like sweetness fruit floral herbal or acid she has these logos and if you um buy coffee 
you will see um, if, if the coffee is more acid than sweet, the logo will be bigger than the, the sweetness logo or the fruit logo. And so in this way, you can, um, you can a little bit reflect on, oh yeah, last time I tasted this, this, were, this was too, too much acid for me. Maybe I have to look for the other label. And, and in this way, um, she wants to guide the, the, the customers in her collection of coffees. Mm -hmm. I have a, a question uh, in relation to something. Sorry, here, do you want to go? Uh, I think uh, Billy had a question. Um, uh, she raised her hand. I cannot hear you, Billy. You're, um, yes, I, I've uh, muted, my, unmuted myself. Oh. Um, yeah, just one observation that I thought um, that makes the this project sort of quite tricky in a way um, is that if we're not to refer sounds to what they sound like the source might be, um, then we're almost forced to make new words. But what we're actually doing is trying to make sounds about sounds. Which, which isn't the case if we're trying to make up words for the smell. And so we end up with sort of onomatopoeic kind of sounds. You know, I was just thinking if I was really to describe to someone what the sound you played sounded like, the kind of sounds I would make, you know, clink, cluck, cluck, you know, really in a way, I, all I'm doing is trying to reproduce the sounds vocally, um, which is not exactly what you're trying to do. So that, <laughs> I don't know what, where that leads, but it does strike me as a, as a bit of an I, extra I, no, but I, Your uh, observation I, is perfect. Uh, sorry, if I may, uh, Stein, um, <laughs> because that goes back to Wittgenstein again. Uh, the origins of language are onomatopoeic. The reason why a cow is called a cow, for some reason, is because people thought the sound that it made sounded like cow, right? Or why why a cat is a cat because originally the sound that the cat made was the word that we used to describe it. So actually, it makes a lot of sense to uh, it's very human to use onomatopoeic sounds to describe uh, uh, what you hear, and that then evolves into something more abstract over time. But you have to start somewhere, right? Yes, indeed, it's very tricky. Um, I asked the same question a little bit to the the professor and the sommelier. Uh, during the podcast, uh, in, this, in, in the way that um, how how does language um, start? I don't know the word. How does it start? But when does language start to fit with the the people? And he said by using it a lot. So if you would go on the trip of uh, inventing new words then to be socialized, it will be difficult when you use uh, words that already exist, then you have more chance like sommelier and wine culture do. They use lang uh, language out of uh, other kinds of disciplines also, and they refer to the source, but also to the, to the taste and to the to blossoms and everything. I'm not that specialized in, in, in wine. But um, they say if you want to socialize the language and you will you would use uh, onomatopoeia, it would be uh, very difficult. But in the other way, he says um, it's maybe not um, it's it's worth investigating that um, like the examples I gave uh, in Japanese that you will see that uh, sound and language is not uh, often very far from the sound itself. So I did a little bit, I will share my screen, but it's in Dutch, I cannot, sorry, I cannot, uh, I didn't translate it, but when I do a project, I always do it with myself. And I was uh, looking to all my sounds, I recorded myself and, uh, in the beginning, when I was recording sounds, I had like door one, door two, door three. But to to look back in my uh, classification of sounds, it was very uh, very difficult to find the right door. So I started to to use adjectives, and uh, I listed all my adjectives up in a, in a list, 
and then I tried to categorize all the adjectives, and then I had like certain, um, yeah, bigger groups, um, percussive, um, rubbing sounds, uh, zooming sounds, knispering sounds, all, all these kind of categories, and then I was trying to make diagrams. Uh, is the sound percussive, yes or no, and this kind of, so, I can only uh, agree on the fact that it's tricky, but uh, that's also the ambition to do it in a very artistical way and to, uh, to not avoid because it's tricky and to, to try and, and see where we get. Yes, I'm um, sorry to um, uh, Billy and um... Yuka Peke had a question. Billy, would you like to go first and then Yuka, um, you would like to follow? Yeah, I think I'm really interested in what you're talking about. What I'm interested in is there's two things. One is that there's this idea that blind people have always been blind. And in fact, a lot of blind people have become blind during their lifetime. So they bring with them an experience of already seeing like deaf people might already bring with them an experience of sound and that's going to alter everybody's perception so that that's and and i've done some work with um deaf and blind arts organizations and um in trying to interpret the world around them they're using a lot of the information they already carry within them it's not something that they've just sort of has happened or they've been born into. So that there's a, this, you know, adaption that's happened over a long period of time. And I think the second thing is the qualitative nature. And I think that, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten, is it Robert? I think Robert was, was alluding to that, is that there is a qualitative nature to words. And I think uh, there's Jessica Smith who describes words as events that a word is not a descriptive instance. It does not directly point to a thing, but becomes meaningful in a certain point of time. And for example, when you did those sounds, um, I hate to admit to this, but my husband was bringing me a gin and tonic and I thought it sounded like ice clicking against the glass. And it's that context of where you're hearing it that gives it its meaning. And I will finish because I'm an artist who works a lot with threads. And there is um, a quote by Cecilia Vicuña, who says, a word once written becomes risks becoming linear, but word and thread exist on another dimensional plane, vibratory forms in space and time. And I think it's sound and it's um, the context that gives it meaning and the person. So it's not really a question, it's just an observation. <laughs> but thank you. And I, I love what you're doing. I think it's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, Yuka Peke, you would like to add something to that? Yeah, thanks, Gerard, and, and thank you, Stein. Um, I'm, I don't know about the sound atlas, so I, I don't know if what I'm going to say is relevant to that, but it's definitely relevant to the echolocation work you're going to do. And the thing is, when you work with, so I work with accessibility, and, and a finding is one of the things you have to work on then. And if you're visually impaired, and you use sound in way, way finding, whether it's, it's rarely clicking your tongue in practice, but it's an interesting project. I'm not this saying that. What, what, what you do is you link those sounds to actions, and, and, and you have sort of action scripts. So you hear echoes or reverberation from something hard like glass. So, okay, if you know your environment, you're asking yourself, is that the glass door which you want to open? Or is that the glass wall which you don't want to bump into? Or you hear people's voices sort of reverberating. And these are practical examples. You'd know that your canteen at work is there because there's no way you can find your canteen because it's not marked for blind persons visually impaired persons. So the only way you'd find your canteen at work would be by hearing where the sound of 
deep flow is coming from, and, and, and those spoons and forks and so forth. So the semantic space of, of sound and describing space is vast, but the, there is a sort of a bottleneck, and it's these action scripts. And of course, it changes. You might be very often come across voice sounds that you want to recognize, like the elevator or something, whether you want to avoid it or search it again. But if you're in an unknown environment, then it's of course a different question. Then you might want to recognize a sound, but the, it becomes complicated, as you say. How much about the environment do you know? How, how, how many risks are you going to take on the basis of the sounds that you might recognize? But as I said, it, this is not directly linked to a project. These are just observations. That's very interesting. Thanks. Thank you, Yuka. This is, uh, um, I, I also took some classes echolocation because I was too curious. And they start by uh, doing echolocation indoor. And uh, actually they start by doing like taking an object and then you move it before your face and, and, and things like that and beside your ears. And, and also then they expand by using a bowl or a flat um, a flat flat thing in in plastic and a bowl and metal and then glass and it goes further and further and um, and it's quite easy to find and to grab uh, but it's not always easy to know what is the the material what is the source uh, um, is it is it later on will it be a car or a or a, a, a wall eh? so th this kind of reflections in when i went outdoors by clicking uh, just as a starter it became very complex because of the wind because of the the um, the dynamics of the city because of everything it's very complex to do indoor you can locate uh, but outdoor, it's very complex. It was, uh, it was a very nice experience to do. Jackie, would you like to ask a question? Um, yeah, well, um, it, was, it was a kind of question, yeah. I, um, I, to me, the sound was like a um, kind of reverse dining conversation is like um uh it's like a reverse dinner because it sounded like cutlery uh on plates but backwards so i don't know if there was a reversed element but i felt like i was going backwards <laughs> so um but this is also relevant to um installation work i am doing which is mechanized sculpture of cutlery on plates and so it's so again it's that contextual um what's contextual for me but i wondered how much kind of like poetry was a part of describing sounds maybe you know analogy or um poetry so i mean so um to transfigure the sound transfigure the person into a different place that kind of thing. If there was an element of poetry in there, or that how poetry can be used to describe sound. Yeah, we uh, we were. Um, Oi, I hear myself again. Yeah, no, uh, we, um, we we as we developed the project and we were uh, talking about. How we are, are how are go we going to develop the project? There was a there was a phase that we had like yeah we we have to uh, engage a, a, a word artist or a, a poet in in this project, um, but it disappeared <laughs> one way or another uh, because of of budgets I I don't know anymore. Uh, but the way we are now thinking of is to work with the material we have, and the material are a bunch of sounds we recorded, 
and we will uh, listen and discuss and make some matrices and try to to make some questionnaires and with these questionnaires we can um, send out to different people and maybe we see common grounds on certain sounds and in this way try to to see what kind of words help with certain sounds and with a trial and error uh, way of working i don't know yet we have to do it. typical and projects i do i don't have the truth um, in my backpack so i always try to use the dynamics of the group and to discuss with the with the participants how we are going to develop the project who do we need more to 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 help in the project and and to see how it can develop so uh, i'm also very curious <laughs> but i thought it would be a nice topic to to provocate or to to put in the in the in the cafe sounds uh, great Stan. Uh, Bob, you had also a remark. Uh, yeah. Word. Yeah. Visually, there's been no such thing as an artist for more than 100 years now. The term is in need of a re redefinition. Rather than someone who reflects what they see, instead who, someone who provides the tool to facilitate the process of seeing. Similarly, I see your practice as facilitating the facilitating the process of hearing rather than indulging in a great big ego trip. Sorry, the last thing I didn't get, Robert. Robert? So in comparison, if I can compare the process of seeing with the process of hearing, I, I see them as similarly, you're using the tool of hearing I'm using Suzanne. I keep on coming back to him. He used the uh, what the marks that were made from his reflection of what he saw. Your, uh, so he used marks and paints and colours. You're using sounds for a similar investigation. So instead of somebody, you know, with, I've ever since Malevich, there hasn't been such a thing as an artist because it, it, it's not about that anymore. And particularly the Southern Californian artists someone like Robert Irwin, he sees what he produces as a, a tool for facilitating the process of, of seeing how to, you know, it gives you the, I see what you're doing, rather than making some statement about sound, as giving us, yeah. giving groups of people, ways in which we can approach sound from our own perspective without saying it's this way or that way, but you're giving the, the mechanism. And that's what your yeah. interest, that's what you're putting your work into. It, figuring out what that mechanism is rather than making some grand statement about something that nobody understands yeah. anyhow. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Robert. Babak, you wanted to add a drink? <laughs> or five. Uh, well, yes, but uh, I also have a question for Stein. Uh, uh, something that you touched on earlier, you brought up uh, synesthesia. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you are aware of whether um, multiple different people with synesthesia experience sound uh, in similar ways outside of their hearing the sound. So the, the, the other uh, sense that is triggered by sound, if it is triggered in a similar way. So do they see the same colors or do they, uh, when, um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, um, taste uh, triggers sound, do they hear the same things? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I also don't know. Because I'm wondering if that's the case, the room? <laughs> then we, have, we need a synesthetist. Because if that's the case, then we have our vocabulary, right? If it turns out that uh, the same, that the sound that you played earlier by people who have synesthesia is interpreted in the same way, then that's our description. But, um, when I do listening exercises, I often say uh, you can only uh, react with a color just to to be to be stupid and to to make it something else than associating. And um, I would say 
there is no like, this is not synesthetic people just normal people but uh i would say that uh, there are like always like two groups a, a, a bigger group saying yes it's it's orange yes of course it's orange yes orange and very immediately people can say it's a color and then there is another group who has something like i i don't see anything in color by hearing this sound um but uh, i i don't have experience with real synesthetic uh, people i'm sorry it's me again uh yes, yes I, I just just wondered whether the um a question this is a question whether the the problem is we've got is with words and with language and their interpretation and it could be they can be interpreted in so many different ways and i can see where the back's coming from with this you know everybody has their own experience so maybe rather than focusing on words and a vocabulary we need to open it up into a much wider context other than the word I know that's. I know that your project is is about a, a sort of dictionary, but maybe but yes, the dictionary could be. It could be visual. It could be. It could be um, haptic. It could be about touch. It could be about so many things. Uh, and because the word, we've got this problem, haven't we, about fixing words? And one thing I, I wrote just recently is that the word Zoom to me in the last year has taken on a completely different meaning. <laughs> and it's about the context in which this happens. Meeting people has become completely different. If I meet somebody, it's on Zoom. And it changes the meaning. So I just wonder whether there aren't um, photography, other ways of creating this dictionary. Yes, I um, I agree a lot because my first, to be honest, my first thought was to make um, a feeling book, a book full of textures, and um, because blind people touch a lot, eh? there's a lot of Corona fear because they have this social distancing, they cannot see, and they are very depending on touching and feeling things. Um, so I uh, I wanted to do it in that way, but then there was the argument of yes, but then the thing we make we only can make it yeah we only can make maybe ten twenty thirty books maybe, but if we could make a website and we could uh, let it grow and and things like that, uh, won a little bit in the in the discussion, <laughs> but I agree I think it's. Uh, to, to approach it haptically, it's it's uh, I think it's it's it makes much sense <laughs> because words indeed are, are traveling on its own. Uh, not only the sounds will travel to certain words, but the, the words also will travel. Uh, you're right. Yeah. John, you would like to add something? Yeah, thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. great. I love, love your projects. They're very close to my heart. Um, I was just wondering whether you'd looked at Pierre Schaeffer in the early days of Music Concrete, because they tr tried to do something similar uh, in the Solfege de Objet Sonore, where they, a bunch of people sat in a studio for several years listening to different recorded sounds and tried to categorize them as a group. Yeah. But they, I mean, they get, it's very convoluted and have got endless kind of schemata. and. And um, but the, I guess the point is there has it has a similarity with kind of blind listening, and that's that's kind of almost how they saw it because it was sound divorced from its causality and also from what you could see, so, and it had this kind of phonological roots. So association wasn't allowed. Um, it had to be what's intrinsic, what's actually within that sound, yeah. and the qualities of the sound itself. Um, but I have to say, I mean, it's it's recently been translated to English, and it's really, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to use, but kind of fascinating um, to look yeah, at. Yeah, I will use it for sure. I will, yeah. yeah. Uh, and also Rusolo, uh, hundred years ago, in um, what's the name again of his his 
the art of noise. The art of noise. Yeah. He also has like six families of sound. Mm -hmm. I will take it with me. I will uh, take it with me in the workshops, and I will uh, discuss it also with the, with the with the blind people. But it is it is so complex it? what, what yeah. they ended up with. Um, and I, I found work, working with, with blind, and I've done some walks similar to you with, with actually sometimes with blind people, and I found that their experience is so different to sighted people. There's no comparison. And I, if I remember one, someone who at the end of a walk, we were all having this nice discussion about the walk. And we, it's a classic style of sound walk where everyone had to keep, weren't allowed to talk. And then at the end, we could have a discussion. And this blind man called Hugh Huddy, a good friend of mine, he got quite angry with everybody, uh, saying that nobody understood and they had got it all wrong. And um, but also he found the walk really tiring, really exhausting, because I mean you earlier on you're talking about the kind of the choreography and the sonology of the sound walk, but as a blind person he couldn't enjoy that. As a sound walk going through London, it was like existential. It was if he's going to step onto the street. And he'll get run over, you know, if he's not listening carefully enough. So it, it was, it, it was for me, it was a really kind of a le good learning point. Thinking, gosh, blind people's sonic experience is not comparable. And I've done, I've been, you know, done, I've been led on blind sound walks, and I've been blindfolded, and been looked after, and I love it. I think it's wonderful. But of course, I'm being looked after, and yeah. I hear it as a composition, and I'm hearing it as a kind of sonology and all these aesthetic things. But because I'm not, my life's not in danger. Uh, you know, so it's so fundamentally different. Um, I mean, yeah, we, we did, yeah, we did the project uh, of um, Phonorama in Bruges, and uh, yeah, there we have already a collection of 500 sounds. And um, on a certain moment, I also met a group of blind people. And um, so before, before I met the blind people, I met uh, the, the sighted people, the neighborhoods, the 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 people who, who work in the streets, and I asked them, uh, what kind of sound of brooch do you want to, to put in the time capsule? And there are three answers. There is um, a lot of horses and, br and brooch, so they want the horses. They want uh, the bells of the uh, Carillion. Yes, the bells. And they also want um, this technique of, of uh, Kantklossen, they call it. I don't know the word in English, but it's very typical Bruges. So when I asked this question to sighted people, they immediately grabbed to the cliches of what is the, the avatar of Bruges, <laughs> and they grabbed to the cliches. And when I met the, the blind, uh, the people of the, in, 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 uh, in the end of the project, when I met the blind people, they were talking about, um, the sound of the cars on wet cobblestones, or uh, the sound of walking on a small stone. Uh, the details of the city were amplified by this group. It was very touching to 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 feel uh, their honesty and their um, deep connection with the sound, the world of sounds, and um, how sighted people were like. Immediately grabbing to these cliches of uh, of how the city is uh, uh, promoted. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I also did a, a project with a, a blind dancer, and this was a uh, one way, uh, one moment. Um, you know, these recording devices. I uh, I gave him a recording device with the headphones, and when you push once on uh, the recording button, you can listen. Uh, amplified to the to the environment, and uh, I let him listen, and uh, I hold the the microphone in my hand, and he couldn't stand it because I was carrying his ears in my hands, <laughs> and because of my hands were like, yeah, uh, table height, he couldn't uh, cope with the situation that his ears were up because he was standing, but by holding the machine, <laughs> his ears were. He was standing, but his ears were on table height. So this was very also interesting, um, yeah, thought uh, I experienced with working with blind people. Now, uh, I, I remember we started with, with your invitation to, to share some words uh, in your language of origin that may have an 
connection with what they are uh, sounding like. And um, you know, it's, uh, being in the first place, not opaque, but maybe even poetic. And um, I lived for quite some time in Greece, and um, one of the words that, that, that struck me, and, and I love in Greek, and, and that actually was translated to, to English as well. So many of you may know the word, even without uh, knowing the Greek origin, um, is psituros. Uh, and um, it, uh, it means uh, in Dutch, uh, not to give it away immediately, fluisteren, at least. Some of you will <laughs> now understand it. But as well, it, uh, it has as a second meaning uh, the sound that the wind makes blowing to a tree. And uh, so, um, and it, it was translated in English like psituvism, if I pronounce it correctly. So it's one of my favorite words, and I wanted to uh, just to share that uh, with you. Psituros in, uh, in, in Greek. Psituvism, in, it sounds less poetic, I think, in, uh, in English. Or fluisteren in Dutch, which sounds quite nice as well. Lily, would like to say something? I, I was just thinking, because my cat's yowling at me from the door, and I was just thinking, we have a lot to learn from, from animals about sound. And I speak to my dog and my cat in the most ridiculous language. And, and my grandchildren, a language that makes no sense whatsoever. And it just comes from within. And it's not words that anybody could understand. They're ridiculous sounds I make. And it's that primal wanting to connect. And I think that that's um, an interesting way to explore our relationships with each other, particularly across languages where, where we sometimes can't understand uh, the words that somebody else is saying. It's, it's got to do with the tone, the inflection, the warmth, and animals pick up on that straight away. So I think maybe going to the animal kingdom might be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I share an, an album I discovered today. That some of you may have not found yet. It's on iTunes. It's called White Noise, and it's all it's made of Lego bricks. Have you come across this yet? It's like a three three hour thirty minute album, um, and it's amazing. And it, you just think I was thinking about your kind of click sounds and how much detail you can get out of variation of the click sound. But this is like hours and hours of Lego brick sounds uh, with endless variation. <laughs> There's one you track. Can please share it on. Uh, you can share it in the well, it's chat. On, it's on. Well, let me see. I'll find out to do it. I mean, there's like one track which is searching. For, it's as if you've got this big box of yellow bricks. So, I'm oh, sorry, of Lego bricks, and you're trying to find one piece, and <laughs> that goes on for oh, about yeah. 30 minutes. It's great. It's really. Uh, about, 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 but it's full of detail and nuance. That's. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to find a link. Um, let's see. Uh, that's the sound of my youth. <laughs> <laughs> If I may, I have another question for Stan. Um, you brought up um, the sounds of Bruges earlier, uh, differentiating between uh, sighted and uh, uh, visually impaired people, how they uh, um, listen to the city uh, differently. Um, you also uh, mentioned the time capsule with sounds earlier, uh, which presumably uh, then also um, was a selection of sounds that the people who created the time capsule thought represented the city. Um, and you brought up brought up the auditive city portraits that you worked on uh, and are still working on. Um, now, I'm, I, you, I don't think you shared, you only showed an, a map, but I don't think you shared a link. Are these uh, city sounds to be listened to uh, somewhere? And that's my first question. And the second is, uh, did you find that particular cities were seen by the participants as sounding very different? Um, the sounds of uh, Phonorama, so the sounds we bury under the ground for 20 years, are not shared on websites or wherever. So there is, they are in the time capsule under the ground, and there is mm -hmm. a museum who took also a USB stick with the sounds and their collection, so nobody will hear these selected sounds for 20 years. 
the projects we do with um, with the children, the city rings, where they exchange right. sounds. Um, these um, are are uh, on the website and on our um, also on what's the name again? Free sounds. Do you know this platform? So there we have a huge collection of all the sounds uh, of the children. Um, of sounds they recorded by uh, using objects, but also sounds they recorded in the city and also the compositions. If there are lots of differences, I think um, yes, of course, and no, of course. Um, there are a lot of differences uh, because there's always a teacher and a dynamic and a classroom and if you make um, a soundscape together in a group, you will always hear a little bit of the dynamics of the group itself. So they represent it by using sounds of trees or cars or city sounds. But you, in the way they compose the sounds, you can always taste a little bit about what the dynamic of the group is in the school and they don't um, they are not so different also because yeah Europe is quite the same everywhere how the cities sound if you don't allow music and you don't allow the voices the way how we get the sounds yeah you hear a little bit nuances and differences but there are not that huge, big differences. So it's more in the way they compose the sounds that you hear the differences and the accents they choose. Uh, there was once uh, a situation, we had like uh, a moment of uh, where different countries were coming together in Belgium. And so also the students, this was not with elementary schools, but with secondary schools. And uh, there was a, a, a group of Turkish people and a group of Lithuanian people and different yeah, countries. But I, I still recall um, we were listening to the soundscape of Lithuania and the first reaction of a Turkish girl was saying, I thought Lithuania would sound colder. <laughs> so we also have like mentally uh, some constructions about how things probably will sound and but the how would you say the perspective or the the framework or the the yeah the perspective they choose it's only yeah the the, the vision of a group of youngsters it's not the whole big picture so what they want to accentuate is always a little bit their choice and their um connected with their emotions and, and intentions and dynamics. Yeah. But it would be interesting. That's also a little bit why I'm more eager now to do the city rings again. Bye bye. Uh, but intercontinental. So I would hope to, to do it more uh, in depth and to connect it also more to uh, to anthropology and ethnographics, um, how people are related to sounds and um, yeah, connected also maybe with university and university could do some questionnaires with what kind of sounds are chosen in Brussels, for example, and what kind of sounds do kids choose or connect or relate to in, in other countries. And in that way, it would be more in depth and I could. Before it was more like workshop level and now I want to to dive a little bit deeper into detail uh, with the city rings. So I hope to clarify some questions I have myself uh, in the future. Oh, you wanted to say a word? Yeah, uh, Ken Kiff told me the practice of painting is more like a gardener working with colors, easing and allowing each to grow. Similarly, I can't think of a, a, a similar analogy 
with sound. Um, but it's, uh, uh, that's, as, that's the thought, but there probably is one. Orchestrator isn't quite the word, conductor. Maybe conductor or something like that. I don't know. It's a bit too. No, I can't think of one. Sorry. <laughs> but it would be nice to, to grow sounds, no? Yes. <laughs> cultivate sounds and jiggle them about, you know, so they make, you know, sort of, they're happy with each other and they sort of work together and, you know, yeah. <laughs> they like each other, you know. And they have kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they reproduce, right. Yeah. The extent of analogy, the, the sounds are there and we are waiting till they come. Uh, so. <laughs> Sorry, Geert, I didn't understand you. Uh, the sounds are, are, are always already there. We just have to wait till they come. Yeah. Uh, John, do you would like to add something? Well, it's going back to your Rings project. I don't know if you heard of the um, Sonic Postcards in the UK, because I saw your yes. map was empty. Oh, you do know? Yeah, because it was an amazing project. And I, I was the director of Sonic. But we, we worked time. together. We worked together oh, yeah. with Sound and Music yeah. and uh, Sons oh, of Barcelona. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, great. Okay, because your map was empty in the UK. <laughs> oh. But, uh, oh, I forgot but, uh, then. Because uh, we did, and it was because the Sonic Arts Network had an amazing project for, and it was in primary schools, not yeah. secondary schools, and it wasn't in music. It was in something like citizenship, and they found yeah. a way of doing it, and it was throughout the whole country. But then it sadly, when Sound of Sonic Arts Network turned into Sound of Music, it died sadly. But um, but it was a really viable project, I thought, and the teachers were learning, and the teachers and people were trained up for the whole process. It was a really good, viable project. I, I was just thinking about your anecdote. I remember I was involved in a workshop between. Glastonbury and somewhere like Slough, which is near Heath Heathrow Airport, and the kids swap their Sonic postcards. And the kids from uh, Slough, they mistook the sound of a river in Glastonbury as as aircraft in the sound recording, because for them, kind of a white noise means aircraft. And the, the Glastonbury kids heard the aircraft sound; and they thought it was a river. It's kind of kind of telling, but quite sad as well. But um, but it's really vi I mean, a super viable project, and we need to. Maybe we, yeah, I mean, maybe I should talk, talk with you about how to do more of these in the UK. No, actually, uh, I, I, I know this, uh, this project in, uh, in, uh, of, Sound of Sound and Music. We did similar projects in Belgium too. And uh, Sons de Barcelona were also um, working on uh, city mapping or sound mapping. But this was back in 2008, 2009, maybe 2010. And then we met in Paris and then we said, why not working together and not only sharing postcards in Belgium or in England or whatever, but doing it in, in Europe. And this was a little bit the, 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 the starting of the city rings. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know. I thought it was on my map. I will add them. <laughs> Don't tell them. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to, to, to invite you, if you have some, some last questions, last remarks, uh, um, the, then uh, to share them now and to go slowly towards an end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, that then it leaves me to, to thank you, Stan, for uh, provoking us so much. And <laughs> And to keep this, and to you, to all, to to keep this uh, conversation so beautifully flowing and going. Um, so uh, thank you all once more, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, yeah, whatever you may be in the world. I must say, Geir, thank you for uh, inviting me. I was a little bit scared because linguistics and language is not my uh, cup of tea, but uh, by the warmth of your cafe. Uh, I dared to do it, and I was very uh, pleased with all the reactions. Um, I, I feel strength to, to go further. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night or morning. Bye-bye. Yeah.